a research laboratory at the Knowles, metallurgists are studying electron spin resonance, radiation damage, crystal dislocations, all of these being fancy ways to say that we are beginning to understand a good deal more about materials. That's important because the performance of electrical machinery tends more and more to be limited by the properties of materials, all the way down to the atomic scale. Each of those bright spots is an individual atom. Take electrical resistivity. The fact that ordinary electrical conductors have some resistance to the flow of electricity is useful in its place, for example, in a light bulb. But electrical resistance is undesirable in most types of electrical equipment. As you can imagine, Fantastic things could be done if we could just eliminate electrical resistance altogether. Well, we can eliminate it, but at the cost of going to extremely low temperatures. For 50 years now, scientists have known about the phenomenon called superconductivity. The absolutely zero resistance of certain metals at extremely low temperatures. They have no resistance at all. A current flowing in a closed wire coil will continue to flow as long as you keep it cold. For nearly half a century, superconductivity was a laboratory curiosity. But now the field is full of excitement as we seem to be near the point of important applications. Some of us are utilizing superconductors for making tiny new electronic devices, amplifiers, memory elements for computers. Others are studying the fields of force surrounding superconductors, making super accurate gyroscopes and magnetic shields. Still others, the theoretical types, are trying to learn more about just what superconductivity is. A recent discovery at Bell Telephone Laboratories that special alloy superconductors will tolerate a high magnetic field has emphasized again that superconductivity is very much a materials problem. And that's why metallurgists are so fascinated by it. We're learning how to make new superconducting alloys and how to make them into wire, a problem in fabrication not unlike that of making ductile tungsten many years ago. We're coating the wire. That green material on the right is the wire coating substance. And we're winding it into coils. That's an experimental coil on the left-hand end of that mandrel. And trying to understand how the crystal and microstructure of the wire and the shape and size of the coils affects our ability to achieve extremely high magnetic fields. These are the sorts of studies that will teach us the capabilities and limitations of these remarkable new materials and give us some judgment as to what is possible, what is impossible, and what is likely. Much of chemistry is concerned with the study of energy and its action on atoms and molecules, tearing them apart or putting them back together again. This energy can come from the outside or it can come from the inside too. And the energy stored in chemical bonds like atomic rubber bands. All of the chemical reactions which we study involve the disturbance of electrons around atoms and molecules. And we want to focus on energy storage by this kind of molecular rearrangement. Now scientists have been studying energy storage by molecular rearrangement since the early part of the 19th century with results like the familiar lead storage battery. But the fact remains that we haven't really made much progress in bulk electrical energy storage. Much of the world's electricity is generated and used instantaneously. Getting back to our picture of atoms and molecules, the difficulty is that we haven't created enough disturbance and thus enough energy at the atomic level. All of the chemical reactions which we study involve, for example, the disturbance of one peripheral electron on a lead atom, which itself weighs 100,000 times as much as the electron we're interested in. It is very evident to chemists that if we could achieve really large disturbances of these electrons, then it would be very important in a practical way, since then we would be able to store large amounts of energy in a small space. This is one of the reasons for studying why the grass is green, because in green plants, Nature has an efficient system of energy storage. Nobel Prizes have been won for this kind of work, but nature has many doors locked along this pathway. Looking around our own laboratory, we can find many people storing energy in unusual ways. Radiant energy may be stored in gaseous flames, as we see here. 
or in organic molecules, or even as electrical energy in photoconductors from which it is released on the impact of light. We study the storage of pressure energy, mechanical energy, very much as energy is stored when a spring is compressed. Sometimes in treating the atoms of a crystal like a spring, we do cause those atoms to become rearranged. One very interesting result of this is our ability to compress the carbon atoms of graphite into the crystal lattice of diamond. Diamond made by man. While many scientists have found unusual ways to store energy, but this is only part of the problem. We have to be able to reverse the process, to unstore the energy, to get it out again quickly and with negligible conversion losses. This is one of the reasons why we have chemists studying the kinetics of reactions. And on this basis, even thermodynamics becomes interesting and intriguing. The chemists that I know are becoming more interesting and intriguing too, day by day, perhaps because they're so concerned with bringing results from the other sciences to bear on the job of studying the effects of energy on atoms and molecules. Broadly speaking, the activities of mathematicians today revolve around computers. Everyone expects that new and better components lead to more efficient computers. And of course, more efficient computers mean more value to computer users. Component research is an important part of our laboratory's program. Here my associates are studying cryotrons. These are the superconducting devices which John mentioned and which allow novel methods of circuit switching and information storage. People also work on tunnel diodes and other devices in a growing family of microscopic electronics. This, by the way, is the construction of a radio transmitter using a tunnel diode. Clearly, component research promises progress in computer hardware. However, it is equally clear that the efficient utilization of computers, and hence the economic solution to many of industry's problems, is dependent upon the development of new mathematical and computational methods. An example of what I have in mind is linear programming, which is already used extensively in industry. What, then, are some of the mathematical problems that may be important to you in the future? Well, in our group, we have mathematicians investigating the principles of detection and identification theory. Filters have been constructed which can identify unknown patterns, any patterns, in what appears to be complete chaos. The chaos is the green grass, which you see here growing in size. Others in our group are developing a new mathematical theory for the structure of future computers. Their theory is based on a very unfamiliar form of algebra, where 1 plus 1 does not equal 2. To come somewhat closer to your interests, we are developing a new mathematical concept for the optimal economic scheduling of industrial processes. Specifically, an online computer is used to generate a sequence of control equations. Each new equation gives more economic operation than the previous one. Also, each equation gives rise to stable operation of the system so that we can terminate this sequence whenever the point of diminishing returns sets in. These are just some of the challenges to mathematicians in the day and age of computers. In the research laboratory, there are quite a few physicists who are interested in practically nothing and who are happiest when they achieve less than anyone else. But that is research in high vacuum, an interest that started in the early days of lamp research and increased tremendously with the advent of vacuum tubes and all their forms and functions. Now, as man learns to travel through space and vacuum a billion times more complete than electron tube vacuum, research on high vacuum is booming. This research concerns first, creating a super vacuum, and secondly, and much more difficult, performing accurate measurements on it. A new mass spectrometer developed at the research laboratory and shown here is the most sensitive device of its kind ever made and can actually make measurements at pressures of a few atoms per cubic centimeter, the vacuum of true outer space. 
Not only will this unique instrument tell how much is there, but it will also identify precisely what is left. It would tell, for example, what kinds of atoms are wandering around halfway between here and the moon. The sensitivity of this instrument has proved useful in our studies of solids, as well as vacuum. Here you see its use in a study of dissolved gases in crystalline materials. For work in semiconductor research, the science behind transistors, tunnel diodes, and similar solid state devices, we must prepare materials to perfection never before attained. Impurities in crystals must be as low as one part per billion, or even one part in 10 billion. Other scientists in our group not only worry about removing impurities, but also about making certain that the desired atoms are all aligned perfectly. Control of microstructure of materials is giving surprising new insight. Knowledge about magnetism, strength, ductility, and also electrical conductivity. New knowledge of electrical conductivity is not limited to the superconductivity John Fisher described. We are learning a good deal about what happens between electrodes and gases during electrical breakdown. And we are studying plasmas, hot ionized gases that conduct electricity in small bottles, in the combustion flows of magnetohydrodynamic or MHD power generation experiments, in a wide variety of shock tube devices, such as the large shock tunnel shown here, which is well over 100 feet long, and in fusion experiments, where the plasmas are compressed by intense magnetic fields.